A reporter said to me the other day, Dr. King, don't you think you're hurting your influence? Don't you think by taking a stand against the war in Vietnam, you are losing many people who once respected you? They will no longer listen to you now. Don't you think you must kind of move back, go more toward the administration's policy? And I looked at this reporter and said, I'm sorry, sir, but you don't know me. I'm not a consensus leader. <laughs> and I went on to tell him that I do not determine what is right or wrong by going out taking a Gallup poll of the majority opinion. Ultimately, Ultimately, a genuine leader is not a sucher for consensus, but a molder of consensus. <laughs> On some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? Conscience asks the question, is it right? And there are times in life that you must take a stand that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but you take it because it is right. And that is where I stand. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle podcast, the show dedicated on providing you the how-tos of marketing and networking strategies. Here we believe in the Jim Rohn quote, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Hey everyone, welcome to another special episode of Networking with Michelle. You're tuned in to the fourth installment of Perspectives of Black Lives. Hopefully you have been following us the whole time as I'm very excited to bring the first female guest, my namesake, Michelle Talbert. This woman has an amazing story. I've been very fortunate to follow her for about a year and a half and I consider her a modern day a renaissance woman and she was just dropping nuggets throughout the conversation. She probably gave me more nuggets afterwards, but I'm going to still give you some good stuff here. And we discussed the importance of influence and social media activism. And I know, uh, of course, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, those police shootings, those were videotaped. Those were on Facebook Live and they went viral. And we discussed that as to, you know, do we need that type of awareness online? Is this a form of awareness, you know, social activism. And, you know, is will the Renaissance be televised through video, through social media? So we get into all of that. And I think it's really important, as we heard the speech earlier from Martin Luther King Jr., America's chief morale, and he talks about the importance of influence, of leadership, and how we can't play it safe. If you're standing for something you have to stand and you have to go beyond whatever you think you're even capable of, but you can't play it safe. And that really resonated with me. And the conversation I had when I was at Unity Bank, and one of those things is that when we reach a certain level of success, we tend to stay quiet. And I started the thing, I was like, wow, I know I've lost plenty of jobs in corporate America because I refuse to stay quiet. So, and I guess that's, to me, my new success in its own right. But you can't play it safe. And I want to challenge you. How are you leading in your community, among your family, among your friends? What are the conversations, the rebuttals, the perspectives that you're providing when it comes to, do you protest? What do you do when an officer pulls you over? How can we integrate, not just integrate, but interchange the dynamic of our relationship, our environment, especially if you're in a predominantly white environment. You know, how can we interchange that all parties benefit equally? But keep in mind, a lot of people, I've been having these tough conversations with my friends and they're like, well, marching doesn't do anything and boycotting doesn't do anything. And I think we need all of that. It's not an either or, it's and both. It's one, two, three, and four, five, six. Because all of those things, if we're doing it at the same time and plays a part, 
And we have to go from being Twitter fingers to community figures. Yes, we need you to share stuff on social media. We need it to go viral. We need the repost. We need all of that. We do need that awareness, right? But we also have to get from behind the screen and create some change because that's the only way it's going to happen. But y'all know y'all can get me going. I'm going to take a break right there. But I really want you to think about that and um, challenge yourself, challenge others, have a partner, talk to me, reach out to me, and I definitely want to help you in any way possible. Please go to michellegourmet.com for the show notes. I'm Michelle Tabert, great woman. I know you're really going to like this interview, this conversation. And uh, without further ado, here you go. So today, my special guest is Michelle Talbert. She is a mother, entrepreneur, lawyer. I'm going to give you that title. Um, (laughs) Writer, podcaster. Is there anything that I'm leaving out? (laughs) Grandmother. (laughs) Oh, grandmother. (laughs) She's here to nurture us. I really want to focus on how can we use our platform to address social issues. And I know she has a wealth of experience from academia to um, entrepreneurship and just life experiences. And I, I want to see if I can extract that out of her today. So, Michelle, welcome to the show. Michelle, thank you for having <laughs> me. And I love your name. <laughs> you know, I was like, you know, we clicked. Um, uh, any, you know, namesakes, I always like, oh, yeah. Yes. yes. You know. And we both spell it the right way. Two L's, baby. That's right. <laughs> Michelle Matthews Calloway, another one of our Michelles, you know, of the Swirl World. She and I and you, we always do the hashtag Michelle Power. Yes. I love it. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. You know, really honored to share what I know and what's worked for me with your audience. Thank you. You're welcome. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey, and some of the things that you probably have going on right now? Sure. Well, I always laugh when people ask me about being a quote unquote like social media maven or using my platform because ever since I can remember, my mother would get report cards home for me from school and the teacher would always say, Michelle's a very bright girl, but she's quite chatty. (laughs) So I have always been a talker. I have always used my voice in some capacity, whether I guess disrupting when it used to be considered negative to disrupting now that it is actually more of a positive connotation. You know, I graduated from high school when I was 17 and got married when I was 18. I had my son when I was 19 and my daughter when I was 20. And by my 22nd birthday, I was a single mom of two children under three and really had to figure out what was the next phase of my life going to look like because I was working full time. I started taking classes at night. And by the time I was 27, I transferred to college full time, took my kids, we finished school, and then I went on to law school. So I got my degree when I was 30 and then my law degree when I was 33. And so I went into private practice in law. I thought I was going to be the first Black woman senator from the good state of Maryland, where I was living at the time. And Bush v. Gore happened my first year of law school. And I became just totally disenchanted with the whole political process. I mean, I just wanted to go into politics and I wanted to make change. And I believe that, you know, political power mattered. And then I felt that the Supreme Court had selected our president, and it was outside of their bounds of authority under the Constitution, which was proven out in every single law school class that I took, where we dissected what Bush v. Gore really meant. And so I just became totally disenchanted and felt that we had been disenfranchised. And so I went into private practice. After I stopped practicing law in 2012 to sort of go into media and blogging and, you know, all the things that you mentioned in terms of entrepreneurship, I really turned back to social media and how social media could sort of be used as a way for commercial purposes because I had written an ebook. And it really just became very organic because I still care about the issues deeply to use those platforms that I had built for commercial purposes to also talk about what's going on in our communities, whether it's Black Lives Matter or issues, you know, that we may be facing as moms and entrepreneurs, wives, sisters, you know, daughters. So that's sort of the evolution of from chatty kindergartner to where I am now. 
um, in using my platform and being able to spread messages that I hope are positive or at least get people to think. And what schools did you go to again? For undergrad, I went to Cornell. And for law school, I went to University of Pennsylvania. Cornell. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess, you know, I've been in Texas and I spent some time in Atlanta, Georgia. But I guess when you're in state or close within the vicinity, like, are those schools still like a big deal? Or is it just when you're on the other side of the country, it's like, wow, that's like, that's the place to be. (laughs) Well, see, I'm going to have to say, like, Cornell is in my heart. Art. It's Big Red is what Cornell is called. And so I, I'm always like, I bleed Big Red, you know, <laughs> aside from the fact that and, you know, there's kind of an interesting story there. But aside from the fact that, you know, Cornell and Penn are Ivy League schools and I have a certificate from Wharton, which is like typically in a top three business schools, they are Ivy League schools. So that is considered, you know, top tier, mm-hmm. no matter where you are in the country. But with regard to Cornell, a lot of I'm from New York originally. And so a lot of us growing up. Definitely Cornell was like a dream school, aside from it being, you know, in state and being, you know, an Ivy League school. It's just the culture of Cornell when it was founded in 1865. Mm. It was like it was literally founded by Ezra Cornell as a place where any person could get education on anything. Right. So it was supposedly open to people of all races and backgrounds from its inception. You know, that's kind of a nice legacy to have. But what's interesting about going to Penn, I was accepted to another law school that I really wanted to go to. And I'm not going to name it because I think it's a great school, but perception is reality. Mm. And one of my advisors, actually an older white man, and he was very honest with me. And he was like, Michelle, you're a black single mother. You need to go to the school that is the highest ranked school that you get into. Because that's always going to be on your resume and people are always going to define you. And by people, he meant the white male establishment in the legal profession are always going to define you by what your resume and what your pedigree is. And I thank him for being that honest with me. Right. But that's something to think about. Like we always have that baggage. We always have to carry that baggage of, you know, I have to prove that I'm better than I have to do twice as hard to be considered half as good, you know, the black Mm -hmm. tax, all of those things. And we constantly have to sort of weigh what is it to live our own lives and what is it to live for our community, which we do, whether we like it or not, or whether we choose to or not. I'm not a mother, but I want us to focus on that right now because you do have a son, correct? I have a son. I have two sons and a daughter. And how old are your sons? The boys are 27 and my daughter's 25. So what conversations are you having with them as grown men right now? As grown men? And they're actually both fathers and they're both fathers Mm -hmm. of boys. And one of my sons is from St. Louis and lives in St. Louis. And he's Mm -hmm. raising two boys in St. Louis, Missouri, not far from Ferguson. Mm -hmm. And he also happens to be 6'2 and my other son is 6'1. So... There are a couple of conversations that we've been having since they were younger, right? right? right. Yes, you can have the conversation in terms of this is the way, quote unquote, that you're supposed to interact with police to, quote unquote, avoid ending up a hashtag. But the reality is that we don't know anymore Mm. how to avoid being killed. So the best thing you can do if at all possible, is to avoid engaging police, right? Don't engage them to the extent you can avoid engaging them because Freddie Gray in Baltimore like simply made eye contact and that was sufficient for him to be pursued. So it's very difficult to put the onus on, you know, in our case, our sons or our daughter. So the conversations that we're having right now are just really open. We talk about the fears that they have. You know, I used to have a Mercedes and the kids the boys would drive it and they were 17, you know, they got pulled over. We lived in a, you know, considered black, wealthy enclave of suburb of Washington, D.C. in Prince George's County. They got pulled over every single time they drove my car, every single time. And it, it wasn't, a, you know, unique, shall we say, to the vicinity to see a young black male driving a Mercedes. It didn't matter. They got pulled over anyway, you know, so there really is. There's no conversation about avoidance at this point. Our conversation is more so about how do you manage the situation should it arise? So try to avoid engaging police. I don't even, I personally don't even ask police for directions if I'm lost somewhere. I I rather ask somebody who's just kind of standing around looking like they may know where I need to go. I don't like to engage police. So I try to tell the boys, you know, 
don't engage them. However, if you do engage them, please just get to the point where you can call me or dad. Mm. That, that's the key, like to stay alive so you can make the phone call right. so we can get to you. Right. And that's an unfortunate conversation to have. That's the only kind co- I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss. You know, you talk about me using my platform. It's more so I use my platform to say, God, what are we going to do? Right. I just don't know. So have you, I want, I'm assuming, I mean, or does the tone change when you're talking to your daughter? No, not at this point. Mm-hmm. Not at this point. And, you know, you and I talked about this. I wrote an article for For Harriet mm-hmm. a few months back about Janiya McMillan was a 16 year old girl who died in police custody. She was 16. And, you know, from what we can tell by the facts of the case, as 16 year old daughters tend to do and sometimes sons, you know, she and her mom got into an altercation at home and her mother called for police intervention, which is within her right and should be allowed. Right. Sometimes we do need state assistance to work through issues we're having with our teenagers. Right. And she went into custody and they got her to the detention center. And within 24 hours, she was found dead in her cell. And, you know, it's just an ongoing conversation, whether it's boys or girls, Mm -hmm. that we have to say, you know, how, if we have to interact with the state, then what does that interaction look like? Right. And how do we keep ourselves safe? Right. And again, we tell her the same thing, you know, just please get to the point where you can get to a phone. I know you may be feeling that you're right. I know you may feel it's unjustified. Whatever is going on. Just please get to the point where you can get to that one phone call if that's where the where the you know altercation is going to go. Yeah, because I'm here in Houston and 45 minutes north from Houston is Prairie View, a.k.a. PV, mm-hmm. PV University. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you exit, fortunately, there is the um, I don't want to say memorial service, but it's that area where Sandra Bland got pulled over. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. there's flowers and items there in uh, memory of her. And at the time last year, I had some of my black friends, female friends. Their argument was that she, she was disrespectful. She didn't comply. And there's the argument, there's that argument. Then there's that argument like where she knows her rights. She, she has a right to question the officer. I think it's getting to the point now. It's like, do we just comply, pray, hope that we get home, you know, hope that we can make our phone calls because I kind of feel like our men are suffering with police brutality, but then our women, they're dying in jail. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's kind of like, what is right or wrong? You know, do I just fall victim to them and accept that I should be handcuffed and go to jail? Or do I stand right and question them? I mean, what's your take on that? And I know you study business law, but I guess if you can even give us some legal insight in lamest terms or just overall experiences, that would be great. Well, I would say, you know, legally, as you were talking, the whole, it really brought back my law school memories in terms of just really feeling impotent. Just, Mm. okay, you know, we take courses, literally, we called it Black Black People 101, which Mm. is a course called Con Crim Pro which is constitutional criminal procedure, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a Black student who has walked the halls of my law school who hasn't taken that class because we all knew we need to know these rights. We need to know them for ourselves and we need to know them for our loved ones and our family members, right? So we called it Black Students 101. And what that course was all about was what is the legal, what are the legal ramifications? What are the legal breadth and depth of the authority of the state. So whether it's, you know, police or or other actors on behalf of the state, what can they do under the Constitution to individuals and what can they not do under the Constitution to individuals? And so, yes, we got that. We understand, you know, stop and frisk, although, you know, New York had a different take on that and there are other states that have treated that differently, et cetera, et cetera. But stop and frisk, you know, searching your car, the trunk, the glove compartment, All of these things, yes, we were taught what our rights are supposed to be. But the reason that we have so much issue now is because those rights do not seem to apply to us. So even if I shared them, I could do a dissertation on what the rights are supposed to be under the Constitution. It's just that those rights are not being enforced. Mm -hmm. We are not afforded the same rights in large portion when we interact with the police and other state actors. So that's really the problem. 
That is the crux of the problem. Our rights are completely stripped away and the cops are becoming judge and jury. Yeah. So go ahead. No, I said one thing that I realized this week or last week, and I was like, why is it that cops, at least when I was in college, they were always promoting or hiring, you know, and they're like, all you need is 60 college credits. And, you know, you start, you know, if you go through the testing and all that kind of stuff, you can be accepted to the police academy and become an officer. But then I was like, why is why does a lawyer have to go to school for seven, eight years, pass a state exam? (laughs) Like, where was this? Like, I don't know. Like, why? The rules are not the same, basically. Right. Right. And I think what's happened, like with this, even with this whole Blue Lives Matter movement, Mm -hmm. the only thing that I know that are blue are Muppets. Right. Blue is a profession. Black, although a social construct and we won't even get into black, white and race not existing. But ethnicity is something that we're born with. We're born into. They choose to become police officers and study and et cetera, but they also bring their biases with them. And I think that's really where the problem is, is that there are black cops even who, you know, black cops were involved with the Freddie Gray incident. Mm -hmm. So it's really not about race. It is about blue. It's about what happens once they become indoctrinated into this profession. And whether that's because they interact with a lot of bad actors and so that informs their biases or they actually come in with them. And I think it's probably a mixture of both. The problem is that the system is not doing enough to call them and hold them to account for the biases that are leading to deaths in our community. Right. They are putting up what they call a blue wall to protect the officers when they are harming us. And I think instead of looking inward and saying, we really have a problem, we have a systemic Mm -hmm. problem that is stemming from the mindsets of how Black people are viewed in this country. And to think that judges and police officers check those biases at the door when they put on their uniform or their robes is ludicrous. No one does. We take our biases with us. The problem is that their biases have a bigger impact in terms of life and death. And so they have to be fixed. They have to be addressed. And it probably and will take outside intervention, but it has to happen. That's the only way this is going to work. This is the only way it's going to get fixed. Right. What are your thoughts, I guess, with the ideas of community policing? Because initially I was thinking that was a good idea and the greater part of me does. But I've been hearing that. I don't know if this is a city or state thing or a national thing, but basically police can't work and live in the same community because of their because they need to feel safe or secure. You know, God forbid something happens in the neighborhood, they know about it, but then they can't go home at night. It's like, how do we define community, right? Mm -hmm. Because honestly, I'm from Queens, New York, and I grew up in the 80s. I have been in other neighborhoods. I now live in South Florida. I've lived in D.C. I have visited lots of other states and countries and Caribbean nations and African nations and British, you know, Britain. And I have gone into, quote unquote, communities that were considered rough and felt okay. And I didn't grow up there. I didn't live there. I was visiting and I felt comfortable. I felt comfortable because I understood we we had some type of common bond or I understood what it meant to be a person in a community like, you know, fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily believe that you have to live in the community that you police, but I do believe you have to at least have some connection or understanding and respect for the people who are in the community that you police. Right. That's the issue. I don't feel like I have to know everyone's name in a community to feel comfortable and not feel threatened and to understand and to, you know, not be jumpy if I hear a car backfiring. Mm. You know, and I think that's the problem is that they don't understand the communities that they're in. So forcing them to live in a community or putting other external pressures on them that I think could actually lead to resentment and even have a bigger negative impact. I don't know that that's necessarily the right route either. But I also don't have all the answers. I just know that you can be in a community and not of a community and still understand the community and Absolutely. interact with respect. And just respect you as a person, regardless. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Earlier, you know, you mentioned, unfortunately, there's been a, a string of hashtag first and last name. There's been a lot of, I want to say social activism, but social media activism. 
So, mm-hmm. you know, it's just a revolution that's going to be televised on social media platforms, you know, as well as, you know, definitely video and live stream as we've been seeing lately. Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I'm thankful for or social media as a platform to be used. To be quite honest, it's used in a way that enables us to spread the message of what's going on in real time, but it's also used in a way that helps us have a pressure valve. Mm. Because one of the things, like there's a show, I don't know if it still comes on, but it's basically called Survivor's Remorse. And it's similar to the Black Tax, right, where you got to be twice as good to consider half as good. It's also similar to the thought of, I made it, but I feel guilty that I made it. Similarly, with what's going on in our communities, it's like, this is weighing heavily on me, but I still have to live. And so we have this sort of feeling of guilt for having joy or laughter or or something go good in our lives that, you know, a friend of mine who is an activist was saying, you know, I have this great stuff going on in the background, but I don't want to talk about it on social media because then it'll seem like I'm tone deaf to the bigger issues that we're facing in our communities. So I do think social media is also a great valve for when we need to express some joy, right? Like there was a great hashtag about children last week. And it was sort of like all these great memes and videos from kids doing amazing things just to spread some levity and love and and relieve the valve, the pre- release the pressure valve. So I do believe that social media is a great tool and that, yeah, the revolution, the <laughs> laughter, the pain, the joy, the sorrow, it is all going to be put on blast on social media. And I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful for that. One thing I will say, though, and I have to admit, I don't watch the videos. I do not watch the various videos that have gone in the past couple of weeks, especially. And I do believe in the right for those videos to be shared. I do have a problem with them being on autoplay on Mm -hmm. social media. So I am a proponent of them being behind the, this is going to be a graphic video wall. But I do believe that they should be available for viewing. But because of my spirit, for me personally, I can't view them. And I choose not to view them. So that's the only issue I have with social media at this point is that Don't force me to consume certain media. Make it a choice. I follow all the stories, but I just can't watch the videos, you know? So that's my only concern. Not my only concern, but it's a big concern, you know, when it comes to social media and all that's going on right now with video. Hmm. And I guess, would Facebook be responsible for that or the actual platform putting the graphic wall? Yeah, they started doing it, actually. Okay. I definitely get a lot of information from Sean King. He's definitely someone mm-hmm. to follow to get really good information and, and be, stay abreast of all the issues going on. And I've noticed that, you know, you can see it's grayed out and it says, you know, this is graphic. The video you're about to see is graphic and then you can click on it and watch it. So, you know, that I think is a good move as opposed to just autoplay videos. Because even with my daughter, whose spirit is really sensitive as mm-hmm. well, you know, just it's a lot. Yeah, I've been having several conversations with some of my friends. In this particular case, it's a Black friend, a Black lady. And she feels like she's not going to do anything or she can't do anything because she's not a person of influence, right? So she doesn't believe in protests. That's not going to get us anywhere. She doesn't believe putting your money in a Black bank is safe. You know, I I don't know if the black bank is going to collapse. I don't, it's not safe. Mm -hmm. She's not going to share her thoughts or reshare any of the posts because she has no influence. So, and I kind of feel like, well, everyone has influence. And even if they don't have an influence per se, I feel like there's someone, you probably have a friend on the other side of the world that doesn't know what's going on in your backyard, in the South, up North, around the corner. And if you just share and shed some light on it, you can inform them. But I mean, do you think everyone should kind of, I guess, be the social media activist or, you know, should I just stay in my own little world and post what I need to post? Personally, I don't should people. In other words, I don't impose my views on what I think people should or should not do when it comes to their own personal self-expression. I think that she has to follow her conscience on that in terms of 
or anyone would have to follow their conscience on how they use social media or how they interact and the messages that they put out into the world. You know, I think we've all seen people who have pseudonyms on Facebook and other mediums because they don't, and other media, because they don't want to be found by employers and others Mm. because they've, you know, taken certain stances or shared certain things on social media. So I never know the backstory for someone's reason. But to your point, in terms of influence, I totally agree with you. I think we all have influence. I think there's always someone who we can influence, whether it's our children or whether someone in our small circle or someone in the greater circle. I think I look at influence as like these concentric circles and, you know, you're at the center and they just continue to ripple out. Some circles are larger than others and have more rings than others. But we all have influence, even if that influence is only over ourselves Mm -hmm. and what we do, you know, the choices we make. So I think there's always influence. I think there's always an impact. It surprises me sometimes when I do see who comments on things that I say. It's one of those where I'm like, oh, my God, you follow me. You actually see what I post. You know, I think we've all had those moments, but we do have influence. And and sometimes, like I said, I have more questions than I do answers, but I'll post them and it will start a conversation like me. I'm over, you know, teaching people why we need Black Lives Matter or why Black Lives Matter or why we have the message Black Lives Matter. I'm done working on that for now. I let other people teach people why or what Mm. Black Lives Matter really means. I'm going to focus on other things. But I do believe in everyone's right to advocate on behalf of the issues and messages that they believe to be important and of value. And I think we all have influence over someone, if not only just ourselves and how we interact with the world. Yeah, you made a good point because I had two speaking engagements earlier this week. And as I was going over the slides, I was kind of like, you know, always plugging myself, you know, follow me on Twitter or Instagram. And I was like, oh, my platforms are really pro-Black right now. (laughs) Exactly. I don't have any business. (laughs) Right. 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 Exactly. And and, and that's something to think about, right? Oh, man. Yeah. I have um, a community for women entrepreneurs, and there's almost about a thousand of us in the community on Facebook. And I also have a hashtag, Whole Women. And because I I say that we're not only entrepreneurs, we're Mm -hmm. mothers, lovers, sisters, daughters, friends, et cetera. And so when things impact parts of our lives, it impacts how we do business, what happens in our business, et cetera, as entrepreneurs as well. Nothing is siloed. We are all of these things at once. And within our community, there has been conversation about both the business aspect of Black Lives Matter and the business aspect of some of the things that are going on in our community and others and appropriation, cultural appropriation, and things of that nature. And there have been conversations about, you know, Black Lives Matter and the movement and other issues as well. And so I actually posted in the group that while I do not lead those conversations, I definitely believe that that our community, although a quote-unquote business community, is the proper community to have those conversations. Because we are dealing with these issues at the same time that we're trying to close that deal or get that new customer or, you know, write that book. So it's really important to have places where you can have these conversations. But me as the leader of the group, I didn't want to impose my political views into the group. Mm. Right. But I do believe that the members, if they want to bring it up, it is definitely a safe conversation, a safe place to have respectful conversation and insight and differing opinions. Yeah. And that was something I struggled with last week. I don't have a Facebook group or a membership group, but I was I was just mentally going through some stuff last week because yeah. part of me was I couldn't get off of Facebook. I felt like if I got off of Facebook, I was going to miss something for the first time because mm-hmm. you know, I'm very dis- I feel like I'm very disciplined with my social media. But part of me was kind of like everything was. It was just, you know, unfortunate. it was unfortunate circumstances, right? Negative, negative, mm-hmm. negative information, whether it was the initial shooting or just follow-up information pertaining to that the week of July 4th. And then I had another half of my Facebook where there was selfies, people dancing and singing and <laughs> promoting mm-hmm. their stuff. And I was just so confused and conflicted because part of me was like, I'm tired of seeing all this hurt, but I don't understand why you're so happy. Mm -hmm. We got all all this stuff going on in the world. And 
when it came to some of the groups and these people are still promoting their stuff. And I was just like, do I need to say something? People were like, what are you working on? And I literally ignored the tag. Like, mm-hmm. I'm too devastated right now to work about Michelle Gomez and Line 25. Just <laughs> right. Like I'm working on my spirit right now. Right. I'm working on my community. I'm trying, I'm working on not falling apart. That's what I'm working on right now. I'm working on holding it together and not sobbing every time someone says hello. So I completely so, understand. I was at a conference last week when it happened. Yeah. When things started happening. And it's like I was, and you know, it's it was a podcaster conference. I was so, you know, for you. I really yeah. am. And it's like not only was I slated to speak. But I was also interacting with people who I hadn't seen in a long time or had never met. And we interacted Mm -hmm. for years online, people from other countries. And to be quite frank, they were predominantly white. Mm -hmm. So, but I love them. They're my tribe. We were happy to see each other. And what I did, I actually used my platform just for love. I was like, look, yes, I am enjoying this right now because this is feeding my soul and my spirit. And right now I'm surrounded by a bunch of love and I'm thankful for that. Right. So I think that I'm feeling you. It's sort of one of those things where you're looking at people like, how are you happy right now? That That's the survivor's remorse. Like, how are you happy? How do we live? How do we continue to thrive when we have such devastation going on? Right. I used to ask this question in college a lot. And when I was in my 20s, I didn't know nothing. And um, maybe it's relevant now, but, you know, you're Black, you're a woman, you're a Black woman. Uh, What do you advocate first, Black rights or women rights? Mm, I love that question. I'm Black. I'm Black, Black, black and Black, Black and Black. black. (laughs) Okay, so (laughs) let's just be clear. And I know there's people who are going to be like, what? No. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I'm Black. I'm Black. I'm Black. You know... I have two sons, you know, I'm an ex-wife, <laughs> um, I'm a lover, I'm a daughter of, you know, a dad and et cetera. You know, there's a really good book, Lorene Carey, Black Ice, and it's her autobiography of coming up as a Black woman, young woman. She went to a predominantly white boarding school for high school and some experiences that happened. And I actually read that in college in a, in a seminar course. So there were no more than 15 of us in the class. And I was the only Black student in that class. So it was Feminism Throughout History of America course. And that was the only book we were reading that was specifically about a woman of color, right? So I was like, I consume that book. And there's an incident where Lorraine Carey is actually date raped. She's date raped. And so when we went over the book and talked about different pieces of the book in class, the girls in my class who were all white girls were like, how did she just gloss over the mm. rape? And the rest of the book is all about race. Like she, it was like, she gave the rape like two sentences and the rest of the book was about rape, race. How did, how did she not delve into what, you know, had happened to her sexually? And, and I was, you know, 28, 29, cause I was an older student at that time in a college course. Right. And I had to sort of explain about black womanhood, especially in America. And coming up and sexuality and our bodies and the sexualization of our bodies, but yet our race and being sort of having this duality at all times. But for most of us, race does trump. And so, yes, the sexual assault was abhorrent. But what she felt more acutely was the racism. That was her experience as a Black woman, you know, but the white girls were so focused on the rape Mm. and totally missed the race. So for me, I'm very similar. My body matters. I am a woman. I do identify with women's issues, but I do. I'm Black first. And I think that right now, the issues that we're facing when it comes to gender, if you have to say versus race, Mm -hmm. when we look at our community, the race issue trumps. But the race issue trumps. And like I said, I wrote an article about Janaya McMillan, you know, the little girl in Texas who had on the bikini who, you know, the the police officer put his knee in her back. It's still happening to Black girls too, Mm. right? So I'm not divorcing myself from the fact that I'm a woman, a female, and I understand that we have female issues. It's a Black issue right now that we're dealing with with police. And Mm. although, you know, Black men are being killed at a higher rate, just like you said, we're dying in prison too, as women, as Black women. 
So that's a long winded answer that I'm both. It's duality. But if you have to, if you give me a choice, am I going to go stand over there with Gloria Steinem in them? Or am I going to stand over here with Black Lives Matter? Easy choice. I'm a Black Lives Matter. Ooh, I love it. It's the facts for me. Yeah. This is my truth. Yeah. It's my truth. I, and I, I agree with you. And, and my reasoning is I feel that if we take care of our brothers, mm-hmm. everything else will fall into place for us. You know, I help women entrepreneurs and, and her power is my brand. And, and, you know, it's really all about empowerment from the bedroom to the boardroom and, and mm. the programming that I put out from her power love to her power hustle. And I started as Black Love Rules because it was about like, how do we interact from self-love to loving our men or if we're, you know, LGBT, mm. those love relationships, those romantic yeah. relationships, our brothers, our sons. All of that, right? Those are more concentric circles to me as well. It's not just influence, it's relationships. So the relationships that start with ourselves, our romantic relationships, our relationships with our family, our relationships out in the world with employers, and the circles just keep growing, you know? So I think it's really important that we understand that those relationships that we have at home and and edifying one another and not tearing one another down have implications that ripple Mm -hmm. out into society and beyond. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're going to have to have a part two, Black women <laughs> in the community. No, but yeah, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's not about, I think the, the GLBT is just as important. I'm going to just put that out there. It's not mm-hmm. about just having a heterosexual relationship, but just supporting our brothers, men, Black men in any capacity and without any disregard to sexuality just to put that out there to the listeners. Exactly. So I'm going to go ahead. I want to acknowledge you. It's been a fabulous time watching you from afar, following your success. You have definitely been someone I admire because you've been vocal on so many fronts from sisterhood that I love and I need because we know that entrepreneurship as a whole can get lonely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, girl. It's so isolating, right? <laughs> So to find not just, you know, sometimes you got, you got to find the person before you find the community and you have definitely been that to me. So I definitely want to thank you for your contribution. And um, I I just look forward to following more of your success as the time goes on and attending some conference one day. (laughs) Right. If we could be in the same room, it would be awesome. (laughs) But in conclusion, any final words or how do you define success? Oh, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for giving me this platform, right? Because part of the reason you see me is because we're friends on Facebook and I'm just always talking about some, about <laughs> some, it could be anything. Um, sometimes it's a little scary, <laughs> right? but you know, I really appreciate you and all that you do and all the work that you do with connections and connecting people and just, you know, setting an example. And I appreciate that. And going after your dreams, that's a big deal Mm -hmm. for me personally. And I appreciate you for doing that and doing it publicly and talking about challenges and being open about that. So mutual love up right here. Love up fest, (laughs) Michelle Power, love up fest. So thank you as well for all that you do. So Success, (laughs) Success, <laughs> right? It is the dot in the center of the concentric circles I keep talking about. Mm. It is making sure that that dot has what he or she needs spiritually, mentally, physically. And all of that can be covered also through economics, right? And making sure that you have a bank account that is healthy a sex life that's healthy, Mm. a love life, love as in love of self, love of family, love of others, a passion, passion for what it is that you do, whether it's for pay or for free, and being able to be involved with those passions wherever they lead you and following the road that leads to wherever it goes and not being afraid. Because one of my favorite, my two favorite memes, my two favorite quotes, I would say, is One is negative, one is positive. Don't live the same year 75 times and call it a life. That's one thing. If it's a life that, if it's a year that you're not happy with, right? And then the other one is hustle until you don't have to introduce yourself. And I love that. I love that. That one I can roll right off my tongue, right? Because that's the positive one. 
you know, so for me, success is defined as making sure that you do what makes you happy and doesn't hurt others. And you just do it with fervor, whatever that is, whatever it is, as long as you feel fulfilled and happy in your spirit and you're economically sound and feel safe economically, that's success to me. To me, that's success. And people shy away from the money talk, right? You're not supposed to talk about money. You're not supposed to talk about money making you happy. But, you know, somebody said, I think a Zeeler was like, money is not the most important thing, but it kind of ranks up there with oxygen. Yes, because you can do things. Thank you. And you can do things that you care about back to a whole purpose of our conversation today, right? You can bail people out of jail. You can donate to causes. You can spread your money across black banks. Whatever you choose to do, money gives you that opportunity. So I don't, success to me does not exist without being financially comfortable and confident that you can make certain choices. This is why I follow her people. (laughs) This is why. Where can they find you at? I am Her Power Hustle on Instagram and Twitter. And yeah, that that's that's me in a nutshell. And we have the <laughs> Facebook community, Sister Power Hustlers. Uh, and Facebook is Sister Power Hustlers with Michelle Y. Talbert. And that's our group for women only. Brother Power Hustlers get mad at me all the time. <laughs> but, you know, we put out content for the brothers through our social media channels. But that's a space for the sisters. And it's just for the women. But, yeah, you can find me everywhere. Michelle Talbert pops up everywhere. <laughs> and her power hustle on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so much. Personal connection leads to an influential network. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.